Today's shout out is for Zoldinga. Lord of the Nazgul versus Tyvar, Heliod, and partners Ikrashadiki and Timna. Uh, we have just blue mana, but we have a brainstorm. If we can get into black mana, then that would be pretty good. If there's no black mana on top of our library, we're yeah, we're gonna do pretty bad. Uh, I'm gonna risk it. Could be a total blowout this game. We do draw on our first turn, luckily, and there we go, straight into a swamp. We do have our cool basics from the Lord of the Rings set. So we're looking to get down a pretty fast Nazgul here. I will uh, go for the island and we'll hold up Brainstorm and an offer you can't refuse. Because if someone goes for a Sol Ring, I might be tempted to counter it. Okay, a Leonin Elder for our opponent, we will allow. <laughs> and a Jeweled Lotus for Tyvar. Um, let's see, they could still get down their commander next turn. Having our opponents go after their commander as opposed to ours is going to be good, I think. So let's test our opponent on removal. In 1v1, I played Jeweled Lotus without really much care at all, but in multiplayer, it seems like too much of a mana swing to me, because if this thing goes down, you're effectively down three mana from the Jeweled Lotus in a weird way, but you're also two mana further away from casting your commander again, so... Yeah, it's always a bit of a weird one to me. Anyway, we might as well go for the Brainstorm, see if we can fix any of our draws here. Get into a Sol Ring of our own. Um, so it's Hull Breaker, and we can just draw into a Peak next turn. Doesn't look like we're shuffling any of that away. So draw into the Peak, and if we go for the Swamp, and then cast the Dark Ritual... That'll have us on 3 black, we go down to 2 black for the Sol Ring, that'll be enough to cast our commander. I think it costs 5, doesn't it? Yeah, so maybe doing that is fine here. And we'll see which commander people are the most scared of. 1 life to the Leonin Elder from the Sol Ring. Just need to pray that no one has any of that spot removal we were worried about. Because I've obviously gone potentially too fast here, we could maybe have held up the offer you can't refuse to protect our commander. Just seeing a Dawn of Hope from the life game player though. Heliod just tapping out with two lands in play. Now an Elvish Mystic for our opponents, so that's going to start putting plus counters on itself. Tyvar swings into the Heliod player, so it gains Death Touch. Alright, and we have managed to survive the turn cycle, so... Seeing a Hullbreaker Horror again. I think we definitely want to play Read the Bones, which makes us our first Wraith token. I haven't actually seen the tokens yet. That's what the Wraith tokens look like. Alright, Kindred Discovery is superb if we can hold on to all this mana, so we want to be playing the Ottawara as an island. Uh, I think we'll keep both of these, actually, because, yeah, that will fix our colours nicely. We need to get into some jewels, really. So we'll hold up Peak and an offer you can't refuse. If we decide not to go for the Peak, we can get out a tap land with the Bloodstained Mire. But the fact that Kindred Discovery triggers on the entry of creatures as well is what makes it so good. If it was just attacking, then I probably wouldn't bother, but... Our commander making us tokens and then drawing us cards on entry with this is going to be excellent, I think. Right, now as long as the elf player leaves us alone, we'll leave him alone. I'll go in at the other life game player. Inspiring Overseer is going to be a good chump blocker for our commander. Sword of Feast and Famine going to be protection from our colours, so I don't really like that. I should potentially hold up counter magic for yeah, potential removal over here. Maybe could encourage a Reclamation Sage or something like that to be cast onto this. Yeah, I just don't like that. I'm going to have to counter it. I can't rely on someone else to remove it for me. A couple more treasures enter, making more life. suppose what I could have done there was gone for Peak and looked at this player's hand to see if they've got anything that we need protection from. Or to see if we can have them use a Rex Sage or something on the sword. So yeah, Peak would have come in handy there. That could have helped us decide if we want to use the counter magic. Yeah, so I probably should have done that first. The Elvish Mystic going to tap for mana and put a plus counter on itself. Not worthy, there is a Dranith Ruins in play now. And out comes Marwyn the Nurturer. So the Elf player doing Elf things. Now the 5-4 goes into the left. And deciding to just chump block with the Inspiring Overseer. So maybe there's a board wipe over here. So at the end of the turn, let's go for a Jewel Land so that I can cast that peak. And we'll maximise the number of Wraith tokens that we can make. I suppose there's an argument to be made for 
waiting on the peak so that we can go Kindred Discovery, cast peak and draw more cards. So maybe should have gone for a tap land there instead if we're going to do that. Yeah, let's do that. Alright, there's a Memory Deluge. So we need triple blue, which means we are playing the Atawara as a land. And we get down the Kindred Discovery enchantment. And we do obviously control three wraiths here, so we're going to swing in with all of them and draw some cards, I think. And I'll try and spread the damage a bit here, so we'll have one wraith token into the right, one into the left, and then Lord of the Nazgul can go down the middle. That is our commander damage, isn't it? No, it isn't. I don't think commander damage is really going to matter. So we draw three cards to the Kindred Discovery. Alright, and there is Wayfarer's Bauble, Myriad Landscape, so getting into some ramp in Demir. Professor Onyx is part of the obvious combo, which I've never actually run in a deck, I don't think. But it's a Spellslinger deck, so it was an obvious include. Sarah Ascendant, and their life total is 30 or more, so... Yeah, if we'd known about that, we obviously would have swung in more aggressively over here. Uh, we do have Menace, so if they don't get down another creature, we can still knock this down back to a 1-1. It looks like they've missed their fourth land, unfortunately. This time it is a Sword of Fire and Ice, which they won't be able to shock anything of ours, so I'm not too worried about that. But swinging in with this thing at us, and then shocking that out of the way is probably going to be a good idea. And it looks like that's what they're going to be aiming for. suppose you could swing in over here, try and get them to block with the Marwyn, which they're not going to do. And that way you could ping the Lanoir Elves before that gets too big. But yeah, instead deciding to land some damage on us. Um, so yeah, we could have gone for the peak there. And block this thing and get it out of the way. But I do want to see the back of the Marwyn, like I said. Oh, I was afraid our opponent was going to do that. Deciding to shock us, leaving the Marwyn alone is not a good idea in an elf deck. They've only got four cards in hand, so we could hope that they're not going to do too much with it. But yeah, I really wouldn't have left that Marwyn alone. Not whether your opponent does have a Plaza of Heroes, not sure if I mentioned that. Another plus counter on the Lanoir Elves when it taps for mana. And now we see a Lanoir Tribe, which puts a plus counter on Marwyn the Nurturer. Followed by a Demonic Tutor, so that could be a one-sided board wipe maybe. A means of killing off non-elf creatures. So trying to get into a counter spell would be a good idea. Tapping down Marwyn the Nurturer for mana straight away does enable itself, thanks to the Tywer, so plus counter on there. There is Aladamri, Lord of Leaves, so maybe that's what they tutored for, giving all their stuff Shroud. It's not worthy that this gives Forest Walk as well, so once they get down the new Yavamaya land, we'll all have islands or uh, forests in play. So they'll be able to be unblockable there. Only forests are over here at the moment. And swinging in towards us, because we are looking pretty threatening at the moment. The Tyvar gains uh, Death Touch here, so we'll just go for the peak now. And yeah, I'm still worried about the Elf player, so even though he's only got two cards in hand, I want to know if he's got some kind of means of overrun. So uh, Lord of the Nazgul is going to make another Wraith for us, and that will draw us a card to Kindred Discovery, which is a Reflecting Pool. Peak draws us into Fact or Fiction, and we see Bajuka Bog. And an Assassin's Trophy, so the trophy's good to know about. Now, is it risky taking 5 damage to the Tyvar? I think we'd need to try and outrace them in the overrun department, really. So we'll allow that through. And maybe we have to start trying to rely on the Hullbreaker Horror. Okay, there's an Arcane Signet. Um, so we've got 4 with the Ancient Tomb, 6 and 8. So we could only cast Wayfarer's Bauble into a Hullbreaker Horror. So if we go Ancient Tomb now... Uh, maybe seeing what we draw into first is going to be a good idea. So we'll swing in with a few creatures. I definitely want to take some Menace creatures over here. So Commander down the middle for Commander damage. That might become more and more relevant. And then a couple of Menace Wraiths over to the left. And that'll take them below 30. And then we can hold one of the Wraiths back just in case we don't get any blockers off here. So... Drawing three to the Kindred Discovery, there is a Reality Shift and a Wave Break Hippocamp. Now the problem is, if we went for Liliana, then we could minus three and have everyone sack a big creature, but there's five power here and five power on the Commander as well, so they're not going to get rid of the Marwyn, unfortunately. Although we know what they have in hand, so are we really bothered about that? 
We'll get them down to 28, so Sarah Ascendant is now back down to a 1-1. One, one. I think we definitely want down the Arcane Signet. And then we can go for the Wave Break Hippocamp and hold up Reality Shift and Memory Deluge, Fact or Fiction. If we Reality Shift onto this, it will open up the Hole Breaker Horror for us to start bouncing stuff. So, uh, yeah. Okay, let's go for that. I'm going to have to discard a couple of cards, unfortunately. Um, Wayfarer's Bauble is good to cast into the Hole Breaker, so get rid of a Myriad Landscape. And it'll just have to be... Drowned Catacomb as well, unfortunately. A Saw Warden to start gaining some more life. Hopefully they can't gain two life this turn. Just holding up two mana over there. Missing land still, so that's really not where you want to be with within a game of Commander. As soon as someone plays a creature, they'll be able to put two life into this, or two mana into this, and draw a card. That'll get them a step closer. We see Heliod the Sun Crowned, which I'm tempted to hold on to the Reality Shift for. It won't be animated as a creature yet. I'm playing an artifact in Spear of Heliod, so that will gain a life, thanks to the Leonin Elder. Not one that you see very often, not a Soul Sister that you see very often, but it's just as good as the Soul Warden in today's meta, with treasures and clue tokens and all the rest of it. So a plus counter going on to the Leonin. And yeah, they swing in towards us again, so I'm tempted to double block with a Wraith here. So uh, yeah, let's go for Reality Shift onto this thing. That will take them off the Forest Walk shenanigans that we spoke about before. And it means that we can start targeting this and bouncing it all next turn, maybe. Hippocamp will trigger. They could have shocked the Hippocamp, and obviously I don't want that. So a life from the Soul Warden will take them up to 29. Triggers the Dawn of Hope, like we said. And they do put mana into that, so going up to 7 cards in hand. Excellent, a Fierce Guardianship is exactly the card we want to protect our board. And a Seagate Restoration is excellent as well. We're just hoping for lots and lots of mana now, which Demir is always after. Drawing the cards is no problem. It's having the mana to cast all the cards. But we can't exactly complain here, can we? So we'll lose one of our Wraiths, but we will double block and get rid of that thing before it gets too out of hand. And like I said, that not only gets rid of a big creature from our opponent, but it protects the Hippocamp. And it does mean that they now have to wait a couple of turns to swing in with the Sword of Fire and Ice, unless they can animate the Commander next turn. A couple of pips away from Heliod being animated. So we'll see if we can get the Assassin's Trophy out of our opponent's hand onto our Commander, because that will definitely see us cast Fierce Guardianship. Lanoir Tribe being tapped for three mana and a plus counter, or three plus counters. Then Marwyn jumps up to nine plus counters and a 10-10. They're floating eight mana at the moment. And you're not going to pass the turn, surely. Okay, not sure if that was an accident. They just floated the mana and passed, so maybe just have a land in hand. Uh, not sure if they played one there, but they haven't played the Bajuka Bog. Tyvar swings in towards us. We're only on five commander at the moment. So we'll keep hold of our Wraith. Like I said, we want to hold on to as many Wraiths as possible and get the huge buff if we can. And it's risky, our opponent, allowing us to untap because it might be that we've got a three mana plus counter spell that we can counter the assassin's trophy with but luckily for them it's a fierce guardianship we can deal with it either way all right a morphic pool will get down before players start scooping because that comes into play untapped all right so it'd be good to go for the hole breaker horror so that we can play the wayfarer's bauble into it but i don't think it's really worth not surprising our opponents really although we could bounce this thing out of the way and then Swinging over there and knock their life down a bit more. Yeah, let's do that. We're already kind of getting ahead of our opponents a bit anyway, so we'll try and allow them time to interact with the Hole Breaker. Obviously, I'd rather do it at the end of the Elf Player's turn or during the Elf Player's turn. Give everyone less chance to respond to this thing. So the Soul Warden gains another life. And then we'll play the Wayfarer's Bauble, which is why I kept it previously, so that we could do something like this. So return a non-land permanent, we'll bounce the Sarah Ascendant. And then we go through to the attack phase, so it's going to be 12 commander damage over to the middle player. We'll keep chipping away there, so that their life gain isn't as important. And then the Wraiths can turn into the left to knock them below 30 again. So Kindred Discovery triggers some more. And yeah, haven't got into any of the clone effects for our commander yet. Right of Replication we don't want to see until the Legendary Rule doesn't matter anymore. Didn't notice that a Skemfar Avenger came into play over here as well, so that's relevant. 
All right, so dismember not going to be too handy. We're going to have to discard again. It'd be good to cast this at some point to get an infinite hand size. Uh, we'll just have to pass at that. We'll get rid of Memory Deluge because we can cast it from the bin. We just need to hope that our opponent doesn't point the uh, Bajuka Bog at us, which he probably should. Our graveyard is the most full. Right of Replication, I would love to cast, but it's not very much use to us while this thing is still legendary. Could point it at the Wraith Tokens, I suppose, and get the buffs that way. And I'll get rid of Professor Onyx because it's part of that boring combo. We'll try and win in the fun way this game. Another Soul Sister in Soul's Attendant. Dawn of Hope allowed them to get into that fourth land by turn six. So uh, not playing their big 6-6 six, six lifelink flyer. Um, I think it would be safe to assume that they could get up to 30 life again with those two Soul Sisters in play. So it might be worth playing that, I think. I think I would have dropped the Sarah's Ascendant. They'd go straight up to 25 when they drop that. Meaning they'd only need to see three more creatures in order to go north of 30. Fiend Slayer Paladin for the Heliod player. And that does animate the Heliod, so they'll be able to swing in with the Sword of Fire and Ice again. Alright, and the Sword going on to the Heliod again, so assuming it comes through at us, we might have to make another Wraith token again. And yeah, that's an 8-8 coming in towards us, so we will go for 2 Phyrexian life into Dismember and we'll cast it for 2 mana. Might as well get rid of the Commander here and we can bounce the Marwin. So that triggers the wave break Hippocamp. Lord of the Nazgul will get us the token, which is what we're after. And we will bounce the Marwin back to our opponent's hand so that they've got less big things to swing in at us with. In response to that, they've got something. Uh, there is the Assassin's Trophy, so now we can go for the Fierce Guardianship. And that will allow us to bounce another big creature. We'll go after this thing as well, I think. Really set our opponent back. So yeah, the Hullbreaker Horror really doing some work for us here. So that is your typical Demir Control stack. Looks like this player has something for us as well. Alright, that is an Anguished on making, so really forcing my opponents to interact and get rid of the Hullbreaker Horror. We'll still get the triggers, so I'm fine with this outcome. Hullbreaker Horror does get exiled. And we've still got cards to draw from the Lord of the Nazgul. Did I not say that Kindred Discovery is excellent in this deck? So that is more Soul Sisters triggers and Dawn of Hope. They don't have the surplus mana for, unfortunately. Now seeing a Cyclonic Rift as well, just to add insult to injury on our opponents. And then with the other Wraith trigger entering, it's more Soul Sisters stuff and we'll draw another card to the enchantment. And that sees us into a Knight's Whisper. There's a Feed the Swarm as well from the Hippocamp. And finally, Dismember is going to resolve and get rid of the Tyvar. Triggers the Skemfar Avenger, so they can lose a life and draw a card. And now we have a means of blocking the Heliod, so throw the Wraith token under the bus. Yeah, very much glad that I countered the Sword of Feast and Famine previously, because it would have been wailing all over us here. Ozolith the Shattered Spire for the Counters player. And now playing the Bajuka Bog, the target's pretty obvious here, and they do go for exiling our graveyard. So losing the Memory Deluge and Snapcaster Mage, not quite as good as it would have been. Marwin the Nurturer being cast again. So the Soul Sisters player has gone back up to 28. One more creature and they'll probably wish that they could have put down the Serra's Ascendant. But obviously didn't do it because they're holding up Anguished on Making, which turns out it was a good play by our opponent. They're just being really unlucky on the mana over there. Okay, we draw into Teferi's Ageless Insight, which will be really rubbing salt in the wound for our opponents. I'm thinking that we're just going to have to hold up the Cyclonic Rift during this next turn cycle because that will effectively buy us another turn. And that's what you do in Demir. So three, four, five, six, seven means we have four mana to do something else. Drop the uh, Reflecting Pool. So we could just set up and go for Teferi's Ageless Insight. That means we draw a bunch of cards when we swing in. So probably not best to go for that yet. Now let's swing in either way. I think we just hold up Factor Fiction and Frantic Search. So the Lord of the Nazgul can continue down the middle for the commander damage. And then the Wraiths continue down the left, so we'll draw five cards here. Definitely want to keep this player's life total down for that Serra Ascendant. Alright, we draw into Demonic Tutor. Another means of untapping lands in Pour Over the Pages and Snap. And there's a Mystic Sanctuary and another land. We just have to hold up Cyclonic Rift here because our life total is teetering so low. Could do it during the Heliod player's turn, I think. 
And we can always ditch things into the bin to grab back with Snap Mage later. So we'll get rid of Feed the Swarm, Night's Whisper. Don't think we really need the Fact or Fiction. Get rid of Pour Over the Pages and the Polluted Delta. We'll hold on to Mystic Sanctuary because we do have three islands. No, we don't have three islands, I'm just noticing. Well, I can't deselect this now, unfortunately, thanks to Magical Lines. Weird weirdness. It's weird weirdness. Yeah, so we'll just get rid of the Mystic Sanctuary. I'm hoping that we'll be able to go for the Seagate Restoration next turn and not worry about hand size for the rest of the game. And that obviously means that we'll likely be drawing into lands. We've got Frantic Search to get into lands with as well. A Veto, Thorn of the Dusk Rose, is snap-worthy, I think. Because we're going to see creatures hitting the field throughout the entire turn cycle. Unfortunately, it does mean that we're going to make a Wraith token when we do that. But we'll just have to take the damage here, I think. Shouldn't be taking any more damage thanks to the Cyclonic Rift. So we bleed down to 14, thanks to Veto. And there is the Serra Ascendant. There are 18, so I think now we go for the Snap before the Serra Ascendant comes into the Veto. Bounce that thing out. Like I said, unfortunately, we'll see a Wraith enter first, so we'll take another 2 damage. Draw to the Kindred Discovery and to the Wave Break Hippocamp again. And there is a Culling the Weak to make some more mana for us, which could be very relevant, actually. So our opponent managing to knock us down to 12. We have the Ancient Tomb to tap down yet. Wavebreaker Hippocamp will draw us into a Talisman, speaking of losing life. And then the Snap will bounce the Veto and allow us to untap some lands. And then they can gain life with Serra Ascendant and the Soul Sisters. I'm not really interested in that. Only three wraiths away from getting the massive buff on these creatures. We could actually do it fairly quickly. If we go for Culling the Weak, Frantic Search, and where is it? The Cyclonic Rift. Then we could maybe Alpha Strike some players next turn. I think using the Culling the Weak mana into Seagate Restoration will be a better use of the mana though. Healer of the Pride for Heliod. Um, yeah, like I said, not really too worried about how much life they're gaining if we're going after commander damage. Don't have a means of buffing our commander, unfortunately, otherwise we'd have them on commander next turn. Alright, the Heliod not turning in sideways this turn is excellent. It means that we can hold up the Cyclonic Rift for during the Elf player's turn. Potentially do it at the end of their turn and completely blow everyone out. I'm sure they're fully expecting a Cyclonic Rift with all this mana held up. Just Tyvar coming into play for the Elf player. Then Marwyn tapping down for mana, jumping up to a 7-7 with 6 plus counters on it. Floating 3 green mana. Then it's Dranith Ruins, two plus counters on a non-human you control, so putting it on the Tyvar. And we have encouraged our opponent to pretty much tap out here. Elvish Mystic tapping for mana as well, floating two, two cards in hand. Alright, and they did have something else for us, and Ozolith will put the plus counter over to the Skemfar Avenger. So we'll go through to the beginning of combat, and let's go for the Frantic Search. Um, we can still afford 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, yep, yeah, we can still afford, even if our opponents manage to do something to us here, we can still afford the overloaded Cyclonic Rift. So make another Wraith, which will draw us a card. Hippocamp draws us another card as well. And we don't need to worry about the Serra Ascendant getting buffed by the 30 power again, or the 30 life, thanks to the Rift in our hand here. Alright, we see a Lightning Greaves, three of our opponents managed to get rid of the Lord of the Nazgul at some point. The Malakir Rebirth will protect it as well. And then we'll loot two to the Frantic Search, so some removal in Baleful Mastery. Uh, get rid of the Talisman, and we'll just get rid of the land as well, I think he's fine. Untap the three lands we used to cast the Frantic Search. And now I think we're fine to overload the Cyclonic Rift. It should be fine taking damage to the Ancient Tomb just in case we want to do anything else. So yeah, it's your typical obnoxious Demir Control stuff. It doesn't feel good, but this is how you play Demir Control. As long as we play these decks sparingly, I don't think we have anything to be ashamed about here. One creature away from getting the buff, so we should be able to win next turn, I think. Maybe should have gone Baleful Mastery onto the Heliod. Let's crack the Wayfarer's Bauble. Did draw into a land there, so we can make a land next turn as well. Only three basics left in the library. Alright, I'm just going to not cast anything here. Uh, actually, I don't think the Malakir Rebirth is going to be relevant against the white player, so we'll do that now. So that we can get the buff and swing in with an additional 9-9 token next turn. 
So that draws us into a spark double, a little bit too late unfortunately, but we do have clone shenanigans with our commander so that we can better make these huge 9-9 Wraith tokens, which are now being buffed up to the 9-9 point. So now we should be able to deal commander damage to the mono white player, and the other two should be able to get alpha striked, I think. Alright, that player decided to scoop, so don't think he was screwing over the Timna player really, because it probably goes down here anyway. I haven't actually done the maths on this. Alright, yeah, and our opponent seeing the Cyclonic Rift gets the ever eternal conversation going as to whether Cyclonic Rift should be banned or not. And I'm not sure if the Heliod player is going to pass priority over to us now or not. Argument to be made for me going for Demonic Tutor into a counter spell first, I suppose, but they could have responded to the Demonic Tutor itself. Alright, I'll leave it here. I'll assume that the um, Mono White player has gone AFK. I do thank my opponents for playing that out. It's not often that you actually get full games on Magic Online, okay, and just as I'm saying this, our opponent passes priority. Uh, not sure why these have been debuffed. We still have nine wraiths, but anyway, attack with all creatures goes straight down the middle at the white player. Draws us a bunch of cards to the Kindred Discovery. Alright, and then just deciding to scoop. So let's see if the client wants to show us what we were drawing there. Well, we got into the Cabal Coffers and Herbal combo, as well as Mystical Tutor, some more mana, and Rise of the Palisade. So yeah, pretty convincing one in the end. Didn't see too much removal and didn't see any on our commander, amazingly. Thought I was risking it going that fast, but it paid off well for us. Like I said before, I'm not in too much of a rush to play this commander that much, because it's not high-powered enough, I don't think, to play high-power games. But if you play it in the more janky, casual games, then... It might steamroll players, so yeah, it's a bit of a weird power level that it lies in. I'll play it some more if the likes and the views do well, so be sure to support the video if you do want to see more from it. Massive thank you to the patrons as ever. I'm Travel Kai. Thank you for watching.